Hello and good evening. This is Jay Steinmetz, and we are here for another episode of the Kansas Legislature on Smoky Hills Public Television, our weekly program on Kansas politics, talking with representatives from Topeka about issues that face Kansans every day. I'm Dr. Jay Steinmetz, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Fort Hayes State University, um, teaching American politics, and I have here with me a couple of representatives and senators uh, from the legislature, uh, some of which just barely made it here on time. You've been working late in Topeka, and it's great to have you uh, join us here for our episode of the Kansas Legislature. Uh, let's go around the table and have the representatives and senators introduce themselves and their district and some committees that they work on. All right, thank you, Jay. I'm Troy Waymaster, state representative for the 109th Kansas House District. I reside in Bunker Hill, Kansas, which is in Russell County. I have the following counties of Russell, Osborne, Smith, Jewell, Lincoln, Barton, and Rush. And I'm the chairman of the Appropriations uh, Committee, and I also serve on the State Finance Council. Senator Rick Billinger, I serve in the 40th District, which includes 14 counties. Uh, my counties are Cheyenne, Decatur, Rollins, Norton, Phillips, Graham, Sheridan, Thomas, Sherman, Wallace, Logan, Gove, Trigo, and Ellis. And uh, I serve on uh, quite a few different committees there in the Senate. I am on the Ag Committee. I also serve as Vice Chair of Financial Institutions, uh, Insurance, Pensions, and Benefits. And I am the Vice Chair of Ways and Means, which uh, does the budget in the, uh, in the Senate. I also uh, chair three of the seven subcommittees that I serve on, on budget committees uh, that uh, we split up uh, during the session and do subcommittees on the budget work. I also ser serve as chair of the Buildings and Construction uh, uh, Committee and serve on the uh, Transportation Task Force. It's come up with the new 10-year plan. I'm on the 911 Commission and a couple of others. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Rick and Adam. Okay. Uh, my name is Adam Smith, and I serve the 120th district. It's six counties up in northwest Kansas. And before I get started, I want to say hi to my three little kids at home. They'll be in bed by the time I get home. So hello to Austin, Caitlin, and Allison. I serve on uh, three different committees in the House of Representatives, the Education Committee, the K-12 Budget Committee, and I also chair the Rural Revitalization Committee. Wonderful, great. Um, so this is a call-in program, and uh, uh, our number here to call in is 1-800-337-4788. Uh, we encourage calls from all over Kansas on any topic that you're interested in that uh, these representatives from Topeka can um, uh, 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 answer and uh, try to give you some context. Again, that phone number is 1-800-337-4788. We look forward to your calls. Um, let's jump right into it, gentlemen, with a couple of questions. Uh, let's start with Medicaid expansion. So um, support among Kansas uh, seems high, uh, looking at some polls, but the legislature has been slow to move on the possibility. Where do you each individually stand on Medicaid expansion? And can you give us some idea of where in the process uh, we currently are with that, with that possibility? Let's begin with Troy. Um, well, actually, that changed after today. Um, and we'll see exactly what happens with Medicaid expansion. Um, the Senate had actually taken up uh, quite a bit of time um, having committee hearings in regards to the Senate's version of Medicaid expansion. Uh, the House passed a version last year, but uh, never moved anywhere in the Senate. However, after the vote from today in the House, uh, where the constitutional amendment regarding abortion uh, failed to become on the ballot, um, there's been some rumblings that Medicaid expansion will basically halt until something is uh, happening with the constitutional amendment. Um, personally, I have some concerns with Medicaid expansion. Um, although it will help our rural hospitals, it will not save our rural hospitals, which I think is a misnomer that a lot of people uh, believe that it will save the rural hospitals or rural health care in, in uh, western Kansas. Um, and then my biggest concern is what it's going to cost the state of Kansas. Uh, now, there is a 90-10 split between the federal government and the state of Kansas. Um, the federal dollars will come in, but the state of Kansas also has to pick up 10% of that. And right now, we don't even know what that cost is going to be. And when we're trying to put a budget together, it's very hard to put a variable in place when you don't know what the dollar amount is going to be. Right now, that number can vary from, depending on who you talk to, uh, 40 to $120 million annually. So when you have that big of a variance on how much it's going to cost, and we have other things that we need to restructure with our budget, 
I mean, yeah, we're doing pretty good right now, uh, but it was just a few years ago that we were facing deficit situations every single year. Um, and we have a lot of debt that we need to pay off. Um, so I, I'm very cautious about moving forward with Medicaid expansion. Like I said, after the events today, um, it seems that Medicaid expansion for the time being has been sidelined. So from what I understand it, the, um, the constitutional amendment regarding abortion, Medicaid expansion, one has to go through for the other one to go through. Is that kind of what you're saying? Politically, yes. Uh -huh. uh, not necessarily needing to have one go before the other, but obviously it was very important um, uh, for the Senate president. Um, she wanted the constitutional amendment to pass in the House. It did not. Um, so there was a maneuver done late this afternoon that all health bills were sent back to committee, health committee, and basically said nothing is going to happen until the constitutional amendment regarding abortion is passed by the House. Mm -hmm. Rick, uh, Medicaid expansion, stance on the issue, um, where you feel like we should go uh, here in the future with, the, with the, the possibility? Well, Jay, I would tell you that uh, Senator Denny, uh, who's the majority leader in the Senate, has worked for two years on uh, trying to figure out what has worked in other states, what we can do and what we can't do, what hasn't worked, and he's, co he's come up with some, some very, very good uh, uh, policy in, in his plan. Uh, one of it is reinsurance. It, it has a premium that uh, requires applicants to pay a premium. Uh, there's a type of work component in there. Uh, most folks think that if you're going to be on uh, Medicaid and you're able to work, you should work. Well. So far, no state's been able to implement that. I mean, they've passed it, but uh, courts have blocked it, and uh, they've not figured out how to really uh, uh, make the process work at this point in time. And, uh, you know, he's got a reinsurance piece in there, which will keep as many folks as possible on private insurance. And uh, uh, I know there's a lot of folks in the Senate would like to see drug testing, make sure that, you know, whoever's getting the free dollars passes a drug test. I mean, you have to pass a drug test to get a job, so I think that's important. I think proof of citizenship is another thing that's being talked about a lot in the Senate. And uh, so, you know, it, it's a work in progress, but I, I think uh, uh, Senator Denning has come up with some, some good options uh, to try to pe keep as many folks on private insurance because th that's part of the, the issue. And, and Troy touched on, on, on the costs, you know, for the last couple of years, we've heard all kinds of uh, options as far as cost. Well, it's going to cost this, and then, oh, no, it's going to be cost neutral. You know, it's uh, revenue neutral, you know, and so it's been kind of a, uh, a work in progress. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have, I, I have uh, supported it. I was on the, uh, the summer, that's one of the committees that I didn't mention, but I was on the uh, summer uh, interim committee for, for uh, the special health committee uh, for the Senate this summer, and uh, so I, I know a lot of the work that Senator Denny put in, and you know, will that bring enough uh, votes on? I'm not sure, but you know, I, I think he's trying to, to come up with something that'll work. But uh, as Representative Waymaster has mentioned, it, it sounds like that uh, everything everything is on hold until uh, you know we figure out uh, a way to, to uh, pass a uh, constitutional amendment, let the folks in Kansas vote whether or not uh, abortion should be legal or not. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Rick. Uh, let's pause here for a moment and introduce uh, another uh, guest and panelist who just came here from Topeka. Yes. Um, you had a good drive, yeah. not a lot of snow, maybe a little bit. There was snow. I was a little surprised. Okay. I didn't uh, anticipate that, but I apologize for being late. Thanks uh, no for having no me. No problem. Uh, how about you introduce yourself, uh, the district you're from, and some of the committees you serve on? Barb Wassinger, 111th District. <laughs> I am on higher education budget, financial institutions and pensions, which is credit unions, banks, and capers, pretty much. Uh, I'm also on tax committee for the House and joint rules and regulations. Um, I cover Hay mostly Hayes and Victoria and happen to be your neighbor, yeah. as a matter of fact. Hello, My, neighbor. Uh, hello, neighbor. <laughs> so, um, is there anything else I that's can think? That's all. Welcome that's to the show. Good. All right. Well. We've, we've just uh, uh, started talking about Medicaid expansion, but we're going to pause here for a moment because we have a call. Rick from Alden is on the line. Uh, hi, Rick. Uh, 
Welcome, good evening, and what is your question? We might have lost him. Let's see if we can pick him back up again. And uh, we can continue on with this discussion about Medicaid expansion. We'll see if we can get Rick from Alden back on the line. Um, so we, you know, the question essentially is, with Medicaid expansion, there seems to be some support from Kansans uh, for, for that, for that uh, possibility. But the legislature's been a little slow on moving on it. Where do you individually stand uh, with regards to Medicaid expansion? And can you give us some idea of the pro Well, I guess we've got, a good, we've got a good sense of where the process is. Uh, but where do you hope for it to go in the future? And um, let's uh, have Adam. Certainly, yeah, and I don't need to reiterate points that uh, Troy and Rick did a great job of explaining uh, exactly some of the ins and outs and the details of the program. Uh, generally speaking, I've been a proponent for Medicaid expansion simply because of the fact that we have a, a gap of Kansans that is ineligible for uh, Medicaid and health insurance. Uh, they, they don't make enough to uh, qualify or be able to afford health care uh, in the marketplace or from their employer, yet they're, they are employed, they are working, they, but they don't qualify for Medicaid services. So there, there's a gap of people in there. Uh, I've heard estimates anywhere from 80,000 to 140,000 or 150,000. Those are just estimates. We really don't know. But there is a group of Kansans in there that need health care. However, as, as Troy and Rick both mentioned, uh, we have to be responsible with our state tax dollars and understand what this program is going to look like. I'm not going to say whether I vote for it, yes or no, until I see exactly what the bill looks like. But in general, we, we need to come up with a good solution that works for all Kansans to cover those people who are, are not covered right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Barb, uh, what's your stance on Medicaid expansion, and where do you look for that process to go in the future? I have to agree with uh, Representative Smith, because we really need to see what the program is. I, I believe in hearings that in the Senate, they mentioned that um, it's not going to save rural hospitals. And I think that was one of the biggest things that proponents said, we need to do this, but we'll save all of our rural hospitals. And they said, oh, we never said that. So that's a little uh, disconcerting. And, and they really do need to get, um, get final numbers for anyone to make that kind of decision, so. Okay, thank you, Barb. And uh, uh, let's shift gears a little bit and okay. talk about revenue and uh, taxes. Um, the January tax only revenues were $723 million or 8.76% above estimates, um, about 12.45% above last January. Um, good news? Uh, maybe. Uh, should we remain cautious, I think is really my first question. And does this create a political environment uh, for the legislature to consider tax cuts. And let's, let's begin with Troy again. Well, I think we still need to be cautious. Um, as I mentioned before, we have just come out of a situation for, you know, my first few years in the legislature, we were facing deficit situations. Uh, we did a lot of uh, cutting uh, in order to balance the budget. We took out some debt um, that we need to repay. And so if we look at tax cuts, which obviously we had a tax cut bill last year, and the year prior, um, one happened to uh, pass uh, both chambers, was vetoed by the governor, was unable to override uh, the governor's veto. Um, but that was just, you know, an unfairness in regards to the, the tax cuts that were done by the federal government and just decoupling the state of Kansas from the federal government and letting Kansans keep more of their money instead of having it go towards uh, the state government. Um, but we definitely need to be cautious. We need to look at um, all avenues of revenue. And as I mentioned before, uh, when we were talking about the previous topic, uh, before we start um, looking at things, we have a lot of debt we've got to pay back. Uh, we are still, I mean, even though we ended 2019 with $1.1 $1 .1 billion in ending reserves, baked into that was the transfer that did not go to the Kansas Department of Transportation. We're trying to craft a new transportation plan for the next 10 years and basically the financing method for that new transportation plan is the entire transfer goes to KDOT. What happens if it doesn't? Well, we're trying to see if there's some type of maneuvers that we can put in as far, I know like a lot of the contractors want a gas tax 
that would trigger in case the state would retain the, tr the transfer. I don't know if I particularly am on board with that. Um, but if that's going to be the, the basic way of funding the next transportation plan, we need to be extremely cautious mm -hmm. on how we move forward since that amount of money is still baked into our ending balances that we currently have. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Troy. Uh, let's pause again for a moment, uh, and I think we have Rick from Alden who is on the line. Rick, good evening, and uh, what is your question? Yes, I believe that the legislatures all understand the we in Kansas, the state of Kansas, like all other states, have a prison overcrowding issue. Would that be correct? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. It looks correct. like a generally a consensus there of prison overcrowding. Um, you want to uh, add something further there, Rick? Well, absolutely, I do. What happened is July 1st, 1993, the state legislature passed the Kansas Sentencing Guidelines Act, it, but they did not make that retroactive. And because they did not make that retroactive, we have two sentences, different, separate and distinct sentences in Kansas. So here what you, is what you have. You have old law inmates who have been released back into society who have, have done seven, eight, ten years on parole. But had they been sentenced under the Guidelines Act and gotten out, they would at the most be, have 36 months of, of parole. So you also have old law inmates who were sentenced after, or before July 1st of 1993, but had they been sentenced after July 1st of 1993, they would automatically be released from prison. But because you have the Prisoner Review Board, these same individuals are getting passed time and time again, and they remain incarcerated. So that seems unfair and unjust to me. So yeah, to repeat, thank you, Rick. I, I appreciate point. the question. Let's hear some thoughts. It, it seems like Rick is bringing up of fairness here between an old criminal law and new um, thoughts. There are a lot of committees going on right now, and I know for one, uh, a friend of mine is on uh, juvenile justice reform. All of, all of the, 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 the sentencing uh, guidelines all need to be looked into and, and, and adjusted. Unfortunately, I know in our county jails, the majority of our prisoners are, are really mental health patients that have self-medicated, and, and we need to figure out a way how to deal with the mental health of Kansas so that we can keep them out of jails that are feeding into the, the larger jail system. So I know that the legislature is working on it now, trying to really figure that out. I was not aware of the change in the sentence, sentencing that was causing the problems that you're speaking of. Uh, Rick, sorry to call you by your first name. I don't know your last name. Uh, but I, I would certainly look into that. I had no idea. So, Any other thoughts about uh, comment and question from Rick? I, I guess I just say I don't serve on judiciary, but uh, listening to, to what Rick said, it sounded like he said 1993. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how many of the prison population, that's 27 years, I don't know how many of the prison population that we have right now with the overcrowding, uh, how many have been in there for 30, 30 years or so, and I don't know how many people that would affect. You know, there's, there's constantly a new, a new influx of, of prisoners just in the last 15, 20 years. I, I would like to see how much that, I, I'm not saying that it's not uh, relevant, but I would like to see how many inmates that actually impacts. Well, another thing that kind of added to the prison overcrowding that we have now <coughs> is that we have Lansing offline. Uh, we're building a new Lansing prison uh, right now, and that should be coming back on in 2020. They're moving prisoners in now. They are moving prisoners yeah. in. And right now we have a contract. We just went into a contract with Core Civic and moving some inmates to Arizona to lessen some of the overcrowding that was going on, in, especially everybody talks about El Dorado. Uh, but Barb is exactly right. Um, this last September we did a mental health tour across the state of Kansas and our first stop was El Dorado Prison and we went into the mental health um, ward of that prison I mean it was very um, enlightening I mean exactly what goes on within those walls and then we also visited many other health mental health facilities across the state of Kansas namely one in Wichita where basically police officers will find somebody with a mental health issue and basically drop them off at the back door of this facility and they take care of them for a couple of days and then they're released and then they come back. 
I mean, so it's just, it's just a revolving door, and Barb's right, we need to address uh, mental health along with um, uh, prison overcrowding. Any comments you want to add, Rick? You know, uh, one of the budgets that, that I uh, had in subcommittee was corrections, and uh, they are in the process of, of putting folks into the new facility at Lansing, and then they're going to move uh, some folks uh, around that had, they had a shuffle and they double bunked and so forth. So it is overcrowded when we start talking double bunking and things like that, and it's no wonder that we have uh, some violence issues and, and things like that. But. I think uh, one of the steps that we did take in, in putting this new facility at Lansing is going to help improve things considerably. Mm -hmm. And, and then there, there is also, uh, they're going to do some remodeling on an empty facility at El Dorado, so we're going to add beds there, and, uh, and, and another facility we're going to add some more beds, so we're, we're are, we are going to hopefully get to where we're not over populated. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of uh, the drug court in Ellis County, I know they have one in Saline County, and, and I'm not sure how many other counties have it, but they are also trying to put people into a program, and I believe it's 18 months. I could be wrong, forgive me if I, I misspoke. But a diversion program that well, it's, avoids it's, a, it's called program. drug court because they have the choice. You enroll in drug court or you go to jail. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them, uh, you know, they just had six graduate from uh, in Ellis County, but they take regular drug tests, they have goals to meet, and they have counseling in between. And it's a lot of them, it was, it was possibly one of the most exciting graduations I've been to were uh, some of these people that were, their first choice was jail or, or drug court and they were getting their kids back. So mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of grassroots uh, efforts. This is going on across the nation. So I mean that's that's just a small group of people right now, but it's a start and we have to start anywhere we can to try to help people get back on their feet and back into the workforce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's uh, uh, take another caller. We have Eric uh, from Great Bend. Good evening, Eric. And what is your question? Yeah, uh, how you doing? Um, got a question. Why on the abortion uh, bill that's trying, try, being put through, why is this legislation afraid to let this thing go to the vote of Kansas people, which would make sense to me because it's, you know, the people of Kansas should speak for what we believe. Why, why is it being tied to the health care bill? I don't understand. Those are two different things. That's a good question there, Eric. Uh, let, let's um, uh, back up a little bit as well. They're so not tied together. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a political man maneuver that had the constitutional amendment passed and went to a vote to the people, then Medicaid expansion would have moved through the process. Um, it's, it's, they're not tied together by any means by the constitutional amendment and Medicaid expansion as one. Um, it's, a, it's a political maneuver, so I want to make sure that that's understood. And by political maneuver, uh, how do you describe that to an average voter so that they can understand? So the average voter often doesn't know the ins and outs and the machinations that happen in a legislature. There's horse trading that goes there on. Is, yeah. There's agreements that go on. There, there are sort of give and take and push and pull things that take place in a no, legislature. No, and obviously I would probably <clears throat> say one of the biggest um, issues that for Governor Kelly is Medicaid expansion. She's made that the point in both of her state of the state addresses that that's her, her, her biggest item that she wants through. Uh, we were wanting to put the constitutional amendment in regards to abortion on the, on the ballot uh, in August um, and that failed in the House today. We had to have a two-thirds majority in order for that to go on the ballot. Some of those that voted against it um, wanted to see it on the November ballot as opposed to the August ballot. Um, but when I say the political maneuver is where Medicaid expansion is moving now is in the Senate. The Senate passed the constitutional amendment and leadership in the Senate wanted the constitutional amendment passed. Because it did not, Medicaid expansion has now halted. How many votes was it short of? It needed four. 84? Four votes. Short and it was, four and votes. It was 80. So it, was, it mirrored the votes on uh, Thursday, correct? Of yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> exactly the same numbers. Nobody okay. changed. Okay. Okay. Um, any other comments on that, on, on this issue? on? on uh, the abortion amendment, uh, where to go from here. 
Well, I, I guess I think it's important to say that the House had an identical resolution that's still alive oh, okay. in Fed and State. Uh, we can work on that. The, the, abor the abortion constitutional amendment isn't dead. Uh, we, we can still work on that. We can, we can try to work it through the process and see where it'll go. And I mean, another resolution could be introduced because Absolutely. it can go to Fed and State Affairs, which is a committee that can take bill introductions up until the end of session. So it's early February. We've yeah. got lots of time. We got lots of time. <laughs> Uh, Barb, any comments or thoughts on uh, the? Uh, well, the I hate I hate it being called an abortion amendment because it, it truly is just getting everything back to what where what it was like before a April of last year, um, and and the the whole amendment is to maintain regulations on abortion clinics to keep them safe. Right now, they're they are all being challenged in court. We want women to be safe no matter what their choices are, that there's, there are sanitary clinics, that there are regulations behind it so that they're kept safe. It's, it's truly for women and children and keeping them safe in Kansas. So it's not, I keep getting emails saying they're trying to ban abortion and that's not at all what the bill says. And, and also there's, we're just trying to get it to a vote. We are trying to let Kansans decide and not have the Supreme Court legislate and let the, the people decide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have another caller, and it might be the same caller as our yes. first, uh, Rick from Alden. There's probably more than one Rick in Alden, but I suspect this is just the same. Uh, hi, Rick. Good evening. Uh, you're back. Yes, I am. In regards to prison overcrowding, I saw one of the legislatures ask, he would like to know approximately how many old law inmates were still incarcerated, and I have those statistics, and you must believe me because I was incarcerated for 30 years. You have between 400 and 600 old law inmates who have done 30 years or more continuously to be incarcerated because you have a prisoner review board, each member of whom you pay $75,000 a year to keep them in prison. Now, had they been convicted of the exact same crimes prior to July 1st of 1993, they would have automatically been released without ever seeing a pro board years and years ago. Therein lies your problem with the prison overcrowding. Great comment, Rick. I appreciate it. Uh, any response there? Uh, no, that's that's uh, that answers the question. I was just curious how many we were, how, what the numbers were we were actually looking at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments there from uh, from Rick? I don't have any. Okay. Uh, well, let's move on. Uh, I want to continue to talk about taxes and revenues. Um, and we just got we got uh, a little bit from Troy on that one. But do we have any other comments about that? Revenue projections are up. Uh, is this good news? Should we be cheering and having a party? Uh, or should we remain cautious? Um, and does it create a political? Remain cautious. <laughs> remain cautious. But one thing I want to add is, you know, we, we tend to have short memories. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we remember just two or three years ago, we've been working on school finance. When the Supreme Court finally settled on what that dollar amount was that we needed, it was too expensive to do all in one year. So we have escalating payments still going into school finance. We have to be very careful for the next two years because when we first passed that, the projections, we couldn't afford that. Now with, with the increased revenues coming in, it's looking a little bit better, but we have increased expenditures due to school finance that we need to be very careful with. So would you be cautious in the sense of uh, uh, pursuing uh, tax cuts in this kind of environment? Well, tax cuts are all, all about fairness, I believe. Uh, if there are things... Uh, I think Troy had mentioned the, the decoupling and some of the things with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Some of those things need to, need to happen because it's not necessarily a tax cut, it's about a, a tax equity and treating businesses and uh, individuals fairly. So I, I do believe there's some, some parts of our tax code that needs to be looked at to make sure that we're treating everybody fair. I wouldn't call that a tax cut though. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's go into a little bit of the details. The, uh, the Tax Committee is cur currently looking at a bill by Representative Jim Gartner um, that would increase the standard deduction from three dollars to $5,000 for single filers and $7,500 to $8,000 for joint filers uh, and would thereafter increase annually by being adjusted to the cost of living index. 
Um, this measure is predicted to cost about $50 million a year and deliver tax reductions to around 1.2 million Kansans or so. Um, the tax committee is also considering a rival bill. Uh, and this is the decoupling, I think, that, that you were talking about before, Troy, um, that would decouple the Kansas income tax itemization from the 2017 federal income tax bill, thereby allowing certain filers to itemize their Kansas returns while using the federal tax standard deduction, um, which is predicted to deliver around $61, $61 million in less taxes to around 85,000 Kansans. Um, thoughts on these proposals more broadly, supporting one or the other, or a blend of the two? Um, let's hear uh, well, I, from Rick. I, I, I favor the decoupling. Mm -hmm. Kansas is only one of nine states that has yet to decouple. And I think it was a, a, a bad deal that the governor vetoed that. Number one, we have a lot of Kansans that were itemizing between 12,000 and 24,000. Okay, so if you was one of them Kansas, say deducting at 16,000, you're no longer able to, to itemize. So you're not able to deduct your mortgage, you're not able to deduct your medical expense, you're not able to deduct your charitable contributions. And these folks were doing that in the past. So if you was one of those folks between 12 and 24, you've seen quite an increase in your taxes quite an increase and I think if we want to see growth if we want to see people buying homes and things like that a lot of times your young younger folks which is a lot of the folks that got affected here are our younger you know 30 year old families that are trying to maybe go from a rental home into purchasing a home and they're trying to offset that and they say well we can deduct our mortgage which offsets part of the difference between rent and owning and so uh, many folks in Kansas are, were able to deduct medical expense. You know, there's a lot of folks that end up in bankruptcy over medical costs and can't even deduct them. So I think that's to me is more important than, than the other. I, I would like to see us decouple. Like I said, we're one of nine states left to decouple. And I think once we decouple, then we won't. We will still be able to itemize in Kansas, even though you will take that twenty-four thousand standard deduction at the federal level. That's the change. And you know, for sixty-one million dollars, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that is probably a little low. I think that's part of our numbers coming in ahead of projections. I, I think when when the, the, the LLC tax was repaired, I think it's brought in way more money. And, and you know, when we start talking about corporations, you know, some of our bigger corporations, one in particular that came in to, to testify was Cargill. They ship grain across the world. They have never, never paid state income tax on foreign sales, had never. Without this uh, decoupling, they are now paying. Spirit Airlines now paying. These big companies that are here in Kansas. Now, if they if they did their business in Oklahoma, they don't have to pay it. If they were in Missouri, they don't have to pay it. it, it we're one in nine states that they have to pay it. And so I think it's uh, detrimental to business also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Barb, any thoughts about this? Uh, supporting one over the other, reasons for it, or maybe a blend of the two? I, I I think we really do need to decouple and, and take care of both corporations, retired people, and, and Kansas that want to go back to what they had before because the increased revenue is due to the fact that so many things are being taxed now that weren't before because we haven't decoupled. It's, it's tempting to do larger itemized deductions, and the reason, the reason being is that Kansas does not have a good auditing system for auditing tax returns of people who itemize to, to check on that. So there would be some hiring of new revenue uh, full-time employees in order to do that. So it, it, we're talking about it in tax committee, we're talking about both of them and trying to make sure that we make the best decision that helps all levels of Kansas. So some can itemize their deductions like the senator said about uh, medical expenses and uh, mortgage deduction. It's been a it's been a blow. And if you talk to the charitable organizations, I'll tell you that their their donations are down because people can't 
deduct that donation. So they're, they're, we're looking really closely into it, and I think, I think in the end, decoupling will be the best for most Kansans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adam, some thoughts about that, and if I can add yeah. to as well, putting a little bit more pressure on that other side, the increasing that standard deduction uh, for single filers and for joint filers um, would, would deliver tax reductions to a larger aggregate number of Kansans, 1.2 as opposed right. to roughly around 85,000 or so. Um, additional thoughts on this uh, blend yeah, of the two? I just want to start off first by explaining to, to the average viewer who may not understand what decoupling is. Mm -hmm. The Kansas tax code, to simplify our tax code, we've, we've tied certain provisions together with the federal tax code that basically says if the federal government makes changes in their tax code, Kansas law automatically follows what the federal government tax code has done. So when we say decoupling, we're trying to decouple our tax code from the federal tax code and create our own provisions for that specific policy. Uh, in regards to what Senator Billinger said, I, I completely agree that there are sections that need to be decoupled. And just uh, to go back to what I said earlier, it's, it's about equity and fairness. However, I've always been a proponent of increasing that standard deduction. That is income tax relief that goes straight to every single Kansan that pays income tax. The problem is it's very expensive to increase it because it hasn't been changed. I don't, I don't remember. It's been a couple years since I've been I on tax. The, the, single, the single deduction hasn't changed since 1993. That sounds correct. And well, the stuff happened in 1993. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. Yeah. And then the, other, uh, the others were done in the 2000s. So. Right. And, and where that's been held at the certain level, you know, in 1993, maybe that, uh, that those limits were adequate. But nothing has been adjusted for inflation. You know, that, that $3,000 or $5,000 or whatever your standard deduction is, uh, it's not changed. So that, that value of the dollar is less in 2020 than it was in, in 1993. So I, don't, I think it's way too expensive to increase it up. I, ideally, we would be able to match what the federal government is. We wouldn't have to decouple. It would match the same. We wouldn't have anybody left out versus itemizing uh, or taking the standard deduction. But that would be very expensive to do. Mm -hmm. Good thoughts. Troy, you want to follow up with any of that? The um, raising that uh, standard deduction, you know, uh, for single filers, 1993, that's almost 30 years in terms of cost of living. There's a lot of uh, items in our tax code that we probably need to revisit. Uh, the comment I was going to make in regards to uh, the, the issue of decoupling from the federal tax code is our prime opportunity to do that was in the legislative session of 2018 before those numbers ever even hit as revenue. Um, we should have decoupled then uh, because now we're looking at the revenues that are coming in. Those tax numbers are factored in to um, every month when we get the, the tax receipts, they're factored in. Had we had passed that in 2018, they wouldn't have been included. And we kind of had a figure of what that was going to be, but it hadn't hit the state coffers yet. And now we're kind of doing some backtracking and trying to um, separate ourselves from the federal tax code for the fairness, as Adam mentioned, for the people of the state of Kansas. But we should have done that in the legislative session of 2018. Good comments all around. Um, let's move to a different issue here. Um, there's a negligent driving bill uh, currently stuck in the House Transportation Committee. Uh, the bill would uh, create a lower level crime of negligent driving, which I think includes texting and talking on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. One step down from reckless driving uh, with the possibility of searching a vehicle. Um, thoughts on this bill? Support for the measure? I haven't heard anything about the bill, um, so I, I really can't comment on it uh, because I, when you mentioned it before we got on the show, I, I didn't know what was going, you know, what bill was in the transportation committee, mm -hmm. uh, or how the hearing went. I mean, I don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm not on transportation, and I know nothing about the bill either. Okay. I mean, it's not not been out of even, even been out of committee. Either. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, yeah it's. <laughs> Any thoughts from? I, I guess I'll just say I drive, you know, it's, it's about 370 miles from my house to the Capitol and I, I put a lot of miles on and there's a lot of people looking at their phones while they're driving or down interstate and I'm just thinking, golly, it's, you know, how do, number one, how do you enforce that though? It's very difficult. Um, I'm not sure, I haven't read the bill exactly to see what it says, but uh, I agree something needs to be done. There's a, there's a lot of distraction, whether it's the phone or the radio or, or whatever's going on in the car. Um, 
I'd like to read the bill and see exactly what, what it does. Um, well, let's move on. Let's uh, take up a different issue here. Um, we talk a lot about rural development on this program, and it's a complex issue, right? There's an employment piece to it. There's an affordable housing piece to it, environment, immigration, a lot of different components. Let me just focus on the employment piece of the puzzle, okay? Um, what are some of the ways, some specific ways in which Kansas, and Western Kansas in particular, can attract employers with livable wage jobs and benefits? And let's go with Barb first. Well, if I had the answer to that question, I would be way out and I'd be in the governor's mansion yeah. tomorrow. But, it's a tough uh, question. It it's, is, important it's a one, very tough, tough question. It's, it's interesting to go to some of these economic development meetings because there are pockets of economic, economic development within the state of Kansas that's they're, they're tackling those problems within their smaller communities. And, and I just visited with some of them this past week. So I, one, one community had problems with daycare. And so they, they, all of the private businesses and people in town got together with the economic development director and, and they started a daycare in the town. And they, they were able to take care of some of these. So I think, I think there's a lot of plans on how to do it. We just have to get it implemented. But I wish I, I knew the answer. Thoughts on how to attra mm -hmm. attract good employers, Ooh. livable wage jobs, <laughs> the kind of benefits that full-time workers need and want in order to grow Western Kansas? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, I served on uh, the rural, rural Revitalization Committee as vice chair last year. I'm chairing that committee this year. We spent an entire year trying to answer that question. So uh, I'm really struggling on how to, to drill this down in, in just a simple answer. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's kind of like Barb said, it's, it's a unique answer for each community. And one of the things that we did a really good job last year, I felt, was getting good examples across the state of people that have had good success in their communities, get them to uh, come in and visit with the committee, provide testimony on what worked in their community, what didn't. Maybe some other people can, can steal that idea and implement that in their community. One thing the entire committee agreed on is there's no one silver bullet perfect answer that's going to solve it for every single community. Uh, even in six counties, I've got lots of, lots of various towns, very diverse. Uh, it would even be in, in northwest Kansas and rural communities, it would be a different answer for each one of those communities. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to nail down uh, exactly what would help, but I think if I try to create a simple answer, it's just about getting a lot of resources that exist out into those communities and letting people understand what is available, connecting the people with the ideas and the, the entrepreneurs with the resources that the state does have available and giving that, that jump start into the business. I think a, a huge component of this is rural broadband. Mm -hmm. um, we can, we may not be able to get a lot of people that necessarily um, big companies to come out in, in rural areas, but you can get a lot of the entrepreneurs and people that ha can have online businesses that can also help uh, get living wages within small communities, and and. There are so many uh, dark spots, I hate to say dead spots, uh, in Kansas that have no access to internet. And in fact, uh, I, one of the um, assistants for the speaker pro tem put on Facebook recently, she lives out in the country and it said, your phone will update in two days. It was starting to update two days for where she lives. That, that's going to be a problem for a lot of rural people if they can't have access to online uh, at all. So, um, <clears throat> Rick, any thoughts, ideas about employers, uh, the economic piece of the puzzle of rural development? You know, a lot of ideas. Adam's. Uh, Correct. There's no silver bullet. I mean, I think in what works in one community may not work in another. But I, I personally, I, I, I think the rural opportunity zones has been a piece of that that has worked in some communities. We've been successful in bringing in, especially on, I have seven uh, counties along the border of Nebraska and Colorado. And they've been successful in bringing in some teachers, 
from Colorado, Nebraska. Uh, Oklahoma, I know they have, and I'm, I'm guessing probably Missouri, I haven't really heard that, but the others I have, uh, some doctors, some nurses. Um, you know, uh, it's not a perfect deal, but I, I keep fighting. I, I want to see us continue with the real opportunity zones. I know that uh, there's been some push to try to maybe not to continue with that program, but I, I think where it works, it works well. And I, I think uh, in, in, in my 14 counties, it, it's, it's working pretty good. I mean, I'd like to see some enhancement. One of the things that we always hear is, you know, um, we have our, 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 our kids uh, graduate from high school and they go off to college, and then we export them a lot of them out of state and, and they just don't come back. So, you know, if we could figure out how to bring our kids back home, I think it would, you know, and here again, don't know what that silver bullet is, but something to entice these kids when you graduate from college to maybe have a degree that you'd come home. Yes, we get some, but you know, the, maybe their parents are involved in agriculture and they're going to come home and take over the farm. You know, but you know, uh, I think you know, s s once in a while we may have a, a doctor or a nurse that you know gets uh, 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 into a program with the county where they'll help them uh, with their education if they'll come back and spend a certain amount of years in tr trade off for the uh, the uh, uh, financing of the education piece. Mm -hmm. So, quick thoughts on that, Troy? Employers well, and rural opportunity zones. In regards to the rural opportunity zones, actually, there was an audit that was um, conducted this last uh, interim uh, by the uh, post -le or legislative post audit. And some of the findings were actually um, kind of troubling. 84% um, of the respondents said that they would have moved back to the area regardless of the Rural Opportunity Zones. Now when Governor Brownback put the Rural Opportunity Zones in place, I believe it was in 2011, um, I thought it was a, a very vigorous um, idea to try to get, you know, entice people to move back to the rural part of the state. However, you're missing that component of what do you need first? Do you need a job and then the people will come to the job or do you need the people and then hopefully a job will come? Um, and so that's why a couple years ago I introduced the, rural, the Ad Astra Rural Jobs Act, which was to incentivize companies to move into rural areas of the state. Fortunately, it did not pass through the legislature, it passed the House, but the, the Senate didn't take it up. Um, and that was supposed to mirror with the Rural Opportunity Zones. Um, actually, right now I've been asked to serve uh, with the Dep Department of Commerce on the future of the Rural Opportunity Zones. How are we going to have that program go into the next few years? What changes might we make? What's working, what isn't? Uh, we're supposed to have our first meeting today at 3 p.m., however, we're on the House floor. Um, so uh, we had to cancel the meeting, so I don't have any update on what we had discussed. The other thing is, is early in the session this year, uh, there were a lot of rural um, issues that was addressed by the House, and they came up with the uh, Make Kansas Work Plan. And so that is going to address a lot of things such as scholarships for um, students who want to go to a technical or uh, trade school, uh, the Rural Health Care uh, Initiative Fund um, for our rural health care facilities, other than five counties, um, but all the other counties in the state of Kansas will be included in that, a reduced tax uh, for seniors uh, with the Social Security exemption, home ownership for rural housing, and uh, the Targeted Employment Act. And so if you want to learn more information about it, you can go to makekansaswork.com. Great, wonderful. Um, we have another caller here, but before, uh, let me just reiterate, we have a, a small amount of time left for some more callers. That phone number to call is 1-800-337-4788. You can call with any questions that you have for our representatives on the panel. And we have a call from Liz in Prairie View. Good evening, Liz. What is your question? I have a question. In Northwest Kansas, the suicide rate has increased dramatically, and the mental health services are lacking. Most places, there's not even any. How would you propose to get increased mental health care services to Northwest Kansas? Yeah, great question from Liz, and it fits right in with what we're talking about with, with rural development, right? Um, yeah. How do you bring these services into rural areas? So many counties in Kansas don't have any mental health facilities. We just lost a service. We just yeah. lost one yeah. days. Yeah. Right. We, they closed yeah. the acute uh, care beds in Hayes for youth 6 to 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did introduce a bill this morning that will require KDADS to have not only beds in, in the Hayes and the Hayes vicinity, where there would be you know, a combination of maybe more than one facility, also requiring it in Garden City or 
surrounding area, which could include Dodge City or Liberal. So uh, that was uh, read in this morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some other thoughts about that, Barb? Well, and, and giving some explanation, acute care is what is, is more two to three days worth of um, immediate care for uh, kids with mental health problems. And, and so when we lost that, that ability, that hospital in Hayes, now anyone out in the western part of the state has to either go to Wichita or Kansas City, and usually Wichita is too full. And then they, they, when they have to drive a child to Kansas City, if both parents are working, they turn around and go back. So, <clears throat> pardon me, we also have problems with, with a high rate of suicide with farmers. And, and it's, it's, we're not serving Kansans if we're not taking care of that. And I, and I think when we don't watch and take care of our kids, they become adults that can't handle things later. So we've got to get better. What can a legislature do? What kind of bills? I mean, you mentioned, Rick, what, what other ideas are out there that can? It's, it's all about access to care. Uh, Northwest Kansas, we're, I would I'd call us a desert out there when it comes to mental health. Uh, High Plains Mental Health does a great job servicing their clients, but they're limited in their funding. Uh, I served eight years as a county commissioner. Uh, we, we chipped in some funding. They, they need their state funding. They just don't have enough funding to get the proper staff out into these areas uh, adequately, and it's, it's all about access to care. Any other thoughts? Well, and I would say in regards to the situation with KVC, I, I do think the secretary um, acted too hastily mm -hmm. in closing that. Um, we had many hearings during the interim that Rick and I are on the legislative budget committee during the break. And I, I think every month we met about that issue. And, and it was, she just acted too hastily. Um, the, the bed should have stayed there until a plan was worked out. Um, or you know, we discussed it with the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services instead of just closing the facility and expecting people to send their kids to Wichita, which Barb mentioned, they're full. They can't take them. So th those kids are being underserved because we, the, as a state, I mean, I'll say it as a state instead of just the department, but we acted too hastily in closing those beds in Hayes. And we need to get them reopened, so I'm glad you introduced a bill. All right, great, uh, wonderful question. Thank you, Liz. And we have another call. Uh, this is Rhonda from Wichita. Good evening, Rhonda. What is your question? Well, I was listening to the conversation earlier about how, um, how Kansas continues to export its educated children. But I wonder, given that it is the taxpayer who's providing the funds for that education, not necessarily the patients, uh, the parents, um, isn't it the taxpayer being impoverished by all of this, perhaps we need to readdress where funding for children comes from. And I, I think what you were referring to is once they either graduate from high school and then go to college and then post-secondary school, that's when they leave and they go someplace else. Right now we have the Board of Regents, which I don't think it's going to happen, but um, as far as the budget, they're asking for $91 million more every year, which they claim that if they receive the $91 million, they will be able to keep tuition flat. But that still doesn't, that still doesn't have, answer the question of the flight of the students leaving the state of Kansas once they receive that, that degree. Now, their argument as to why they need the $91 million, not only just to keep tuition flat, but also they say that they need that because they are educating the workforce for the state of Kansas. We have, how many, how many times do we ask them for specifics on that? Mm -hmm. And they just have not provided the information that we, we need. And then the governor's budget, um, she put, I think, around maybe $20 million to higher ed, higher education, uh, very well short of the $91 million that they're requesting. Um, but again, I mean, that's taxpayers' dollars going towards the regent system, which really we don't have any explanation as to what they will do with that $91 million, what it will go towards. And so I am extremely reluctant to give any money to the regent system until we get some answers to the questions that we pose to them. Mm 
Well, last year in higher ed budget, we asked each of the Board of Regents schools when they came to testify, we asked them to hold tuition rates. And I would say, they, most of them said, oh yes, we're gonna keep, we're gonna do our best to keep tuition flat. And all, all of them raised tuition except for two of them, and one of them was Forte State University. And it's a little disconcerting when you, when across the, across the aisle, people are asking, legislators are asking them to not raise tuition, yet they continue to do that. And the budgets that we see are very vague. And so you have no idea where all of it is going. And so I, I have to agree with you. The, the one piece that I, we did, I liked, I don't know about you, Rick, but was the deferred maintenance on the universities. Yeah, that's something that we probably need to address. Well, that was one piece they took out of their ask. Um, so the one, the one thing that some of us liked is now no longer there. Um, but when you're, when you're talking about $91 million, on top of the almost $40 million we gave them last year with the strict um, you know, opinion that you do not raise tuition, uh, it makes it very difficult to uh, well, uh, oh, sorry. sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, so I, we have to wrap up. We're running out of time here. We've covered a lot of issues, though, and, uh, and important issues, and uh, so much more to talk about. Uh, but we're out of time here for uh, this episode of the Kansas Legislature. This is Jay Steinmetz. Thank you all very much. Tune in next week. We're going to have a new panel, and we'll talk more politics on Kansas. Thank you very much, and have a good evening.